Angular.js talk. Um, let me introduce myself first. So my name is Shay Friedman. I am a consultant and a trainer in a company named uh, Code Value. Um, mainly do web development, uh, specifically Angular.js, for the last two or three years, something like that. Um, so um, and we're looking to expand here, so in London. So if you need a consultant. Not saying anything, but yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. How many of you, before we start, how many of you um, have uh, seen AngularJS already? Cool. How many of you have actually worked with it? Yes, people. Okay, cool. Um, so, I hope if you've see, seen it already, uh, you'll learn some new stuff. And if not, Get ready to get your head exploding um, in a good way, by the way, in a good way. Um, yeah, so uh, let's, let's just start talking about AngularJS. So let's start with the history of that. Um, so AngularJS is an SPA or SPA framework. And SPA application is what's called single page application. And this is the, the new black right now, right? Um, all the web applications are SPA applications. What does that mean? Think of what we used to have on the web. By the way, how many of here are not web developers? Okay. Get ready to get your head even more exploding. Like a <laughs> um, yeah, so well, the web was up until a few years ago, it was something very, very strange. Like the architecture was really strange. Think about it. You had the website, and the user surfed into the website, got the UI from the server, right? And then did whatever it did, clicked a button, the entire web, the entire page was sent to the server. The server then did whatever it did and returned a new UI to the client. Now think about it, the server is creating the UI for the client. Uh, who thought about that, right? And this was big like 10 years ago, like think about uh, web forms or JSP or stuff like that. This was how people uh, wrote websites because this is what we had. A few years ago, people actually uh, got back to their senses and understood that client-server applications are much, much more easier to write, to maintain, and make much more sense than the server creating the UI for the client. Let the client create the UI for itself and the server just act as a server, right? So SPA is just that. It's just a big word for a client-server architecture on the web, which makes so much sense. And AngularJS was one of the, um, let's say, first um, frameworks out there to actually uh, be an entire full-blown framework that does just that and allows us to write client-server applications uh, on the web. So Angular started about five years ago, 2009, by two guys working for Google. Um, and uh, it was open source back then. It wasn't something that Google had uh, as something of its own. And when Google saw what it was uh, when they released it as open source, Google said, well, oh, that's cool. Let's take it in, invest money in it, and uh, we'll make it grow. So this is exactly what happened. Google took this uh, to um, inside Google. It's still open source. You can still see the code. You can still contribute. But uh, Google has 10 employees, full-time employees, working on AngularJS every single day. So this is a cool thing. And we'll talk about this uh, combination of Google and AngularJS because we will see that they kind of go together in terms of uh, AngularJS does something, and then Google tries to make it a standard in the web standards. So it, it actually makes a lot of sense. So um, it is now uh, written by Google. And 
a lot of people ask me who uses Angular, right? Now, everybody, everybody that is uh, doing something on the web is probably using Angular, or if they're not using Angular, they will be using Angular. And um, it just, the name of the, this uh, session is AngularJS, the one framework to rule them all, and I really believe that. Like, I see the demand we have in my company for Angular developers, and it's just much, much higher than any other framework on the web, right? Um, almost non, non-existent, anything else. Like, let me show you uh, Google Trends, right? This is, um, I took this a few days ago. Um, this is uh, Google Trends between AngularJS, BackboneJS, NoCoJS, and EmberJS. Now, just look at that. This is, this is Angular, right? And this is all the rest, right? Let me take that. Now, enough said. Right now, remember that Google Trends is written by Google, so maybe they do something on this chart. But anyway, if we uh, take that apart aside, um, this is um, very impressive, right? Um, like Ember JS, which is kind of the main competition for Angular in perspective of the full blown framework, is somewhere like here. This is it. Okay, and this is Angular. So it's, it's really crazy how much demand and how much buzz there is uh, around AngularJS. And uh, I hope that in the end of the session you will understand why, uh, because it really is awesome. Another interesting uh, Google Trends that I did is um, comparison between AngularJS and server-side uh, technologies like Ruby on Rails, ASP.NET MVC, and Node.js. And um, it, it's interesting because you can see how um, the web is going more and more to the client, and the server just becomes a regular server. So you can see that Ruby on Rails were really, was really big around 2006, 7, um, and it's just decline, declining for the last few years. And also all the rest are just somewhere around there, but Angular is so much higher than everybody else and it just shows you that the server is becoming, it's still very, very important, but it's, it's not as important, as important as it used to be uh, a few years ago in the web, uh, because a lot of the stuff is moving to the client. So who uses AngularJS? A, a lot of companies. These are the big ones. Like DoubleClick is um, the advertising company that Google has bought, like, few years ago, and I heard uh, the founding father of AngularJS talking about, uh, about the framework, and he said that this is the biggest AngularJS application written in the world with hundreds of pages and uh, uh, stuff like that. So DoubleClick is a Google thing. They wrote everything with AngularJS, which, which is cool. They dog food in their self, uh, themselves, so it, it makes uh, sense that they will keep AngularJS and not throw it away like some other companies do to technologies. Um, so it's good. MSNBC, Virgin America, HBO, Netflix, YouTube, iTunes, all of these big names, they use Angular. Uh, not for the entire sites, most of them, uh, for parts of the sites, because they have huge, huge sites. But this is cool. Like These are really big names, and I really, uh, not joking, um, most of my work today, like not most, uh, all of my work today is just helping um, companies move to AngularJS. And, and really, I think in the last three years, I uh, did one project with NoCoJS, a very, very small project, and I think that's it. Uh, the rest is just Angular, the one framework <laughs> to rule them all. By the way, built with AngularJS.org, if you want to see a list of uh, sites that are written with Angular, that you can just add your site there. Uh, just a list, just an interesting list to go through. <coughs> so what we're going to do, uh, I don't have a lot of slides. Most of the slides uh, are just uh, bullet points uh, for, the, for the demo. We're going to build a demo so you can see the power 
of Angular um, in real time. This is what we're going to build. As it's called TaskJig because it's a small task management system. And what it's going to do, we'll be able to add stuff like hit this, click add task, the task will be added, we'll be able to complete tasks and do stuff like that. So a very small task management system that we will write with Angular. So, the first uh, uh, bullet point I want to talk about is data binding. Now, how many of you work with frameworks that give you uh, data binding? Yeah, so uh, uh, quite a bunch. I used to uh, write jQuery applications. And jQuery doesn't have this uh, thing, this data binding thing. And when I saw data binding uh, in Angular and I understood what it was, <coughs> amazing. You, you know the feeling that you get the life, the blessing of life in you, or you see the sunrise after the uh, darkest night, or you're in a party, everybody around you is having the time of your life, and you're like stopping and thinking, whoa, dude, I'm having the best time ever. So this was data binding for me. Really, it's crazy. Like, when you go data binding, you can never go back. It's like water. You need it. You cannot resist it. You just need it. And I'll show you a really simple example of that. And we will see throughout the session how data binding can make your life so, so much easier when writing UIs. Um, really, I just, I cannot explain in world. It's just a feeling, you know? <laughs> So um, let's do really a simple, very, very simple um, example. So uh, there is a lot of code here just for the HTML part. Uh, it uses Bootstrap to make it look nicer, but that's it. No code whatsoever at the moment. So um, let's uh, go just, I don't know, let's go here and add, sorry, and add this uh, input type text, uh, ng-modo uh, txt, and let's do this, and uh, txt, okay. So we have that, right? And by the way, the only thing that I did do is at the end here, there is a reference to Angular, right? That's it, that's, that's, it. that's about it. So let's go back here and refresh. So now we have these three boxes. And if I write something, you can see that it just uh, gets reflected on the rest of the uh, inputs. And I can do this as well. So this is data binding in the very, very naive way, uh, very, very simple way. And you saw how easy that was, right? Now, this doesn't help us a lot, right? This is just a simple example. but when you have very, very complex systems, it just doesn't get much um, complex, more, much more complex than that, right? You just say, this is the variable to um, bind to, and that's it, and it just works. And we will see it uh, on the rest of the page, but this is just so you can see how easy it is to do data binding in Angular. And just remember the feeling and how great that is. And I hope to, you, you will see that even more later. So this was data binding. The next thing is MVC, right? Um, everything today that is cool must be MVC, right? My dog is MVC because he's cool, right? It must be MVC. Everything is MVC. Think about every framework, UI framework that you've heard in the last few years, it's MVC. Why? Because it's cool. No one can tell you why it's so good, right? Uh, and every framework takes it to a different approach. Um, Angular takes it very, very uh, directly, let's say it like that. The model in Angular is just a plain JavaScript object, right? Just object that holds data, that's it. 
The controller, again, is a database, uh, database a JavaScript object um, that has methods, right? And it, it uh, handles all the requests from the user. Like the user clicks a button or something like that, um, the controller will handle that. And the view, the view is just HTML, right? The view should be some kind of a template. And what Angular does, which is kind of um, makes sense, is they take HTML and make it and use it as a template. And HTML is a great templating system, right? Really, really good. We will talk about HTML in, in a few minutes, um, about the good and bad sides of it. But HTML <coughs> as a templating system is really good. So why change that? So the view is just HTML. Let's see it in code, right? So um, we are here. Now we need to add. I want to add the controller. So I have a, a script here. Uh, this is not a bad practice. You put the scripts in another file, but I right, do a demo, so I'm allowed to do that, <laughs> but not in the real life. So um, a JavaScript object is just a function, right? Uh, let's call it main controller. And we're going to get something that it's called scope. And we'll talk about it in a second. Now, um, this is our controller, and that's it. Now we can have uh, stuff in it that interact with the UI. Um, what we want to do, um, let's say that we want to uh, have the functionality to add tasks. So what we need is a way to interact with the UI, right? So this scope <laughs> variable, this thing here, this is how we interact with the UI, right? This is an object that the UI, the view, the HTML can, uh, can use. So everything that I put on the scope will be available in the view. Everything that I don't put on the scope will not be available in the view, right? So um, let's add a method to the view. So task. Uh, we'll get a function, and this function, um, you know what, let's, let's create the tasks first, scope.tasks. By the way, if you don't know JavaScript, or uh, this looks strange, that I can do that. Uh, all this stuff that you can just write something, like a property name, and it just works, this is <coughs> just JavaScript. This is not Angular or something, this is just plain JavaScript. Um, which is a very cool language once you get to know it. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the first 20 years, it is not very nice. <laughs> but after that, <laughs> very nice. Um, so scope.tasks.push. Um, and I want to create a new object. So this is going to be my object, uh, my model object. And this is going to be uh, the task. So. Let's, oops, id will be scope.task.length. So this is just a way to create a unique ID, some kind of a unique ID. It will have a title. Uh, let's do scope.task uh, title. We will just see where this comes from. Uh, and description, scope.description. Uh, task description. Let's do it this way. Yes. Um, okay, that's cool. Um, just so the user will have a good time in our site, let's just reset the values here. So now we have that, right? This is my controller. And now I need to uh, make the UI interact with that. So I'm coming, I'll show you here. I have this title and description and a button, right? So this title is going to have this task title uh, variable. Description will have task description. And add task will be um, uh, executing the add task function. So uh, to do that, here is the title. This is the input for that. So I'm just going to add ng-model equals task title. 
Now, this task title here is going to be what I see here. Okay? I don't need to write a dollar scope inside the UI because this is all the UI knows. So you don't need to write dollar scope every time. Dollar scope is just for the controller. So this is the way we interact between the UI and the, uh, and the code. So this is the title. And ng model can go on text uh, area as well. So we'll add text ng model here. Um, task, task description. And last but not least is the button. So what we want to do is when someone clicks the button, it will execute the method. So we have something called ng-click, which say add task. And we can actually execute the method there. Now, what does this remind you of if you've done web in the past? On-click. Exactly. On-click. Now, on-click was uh, still something that uh, you can do, just something like that. And a few years back when jQuery started to uh, get a lot of, a lot of attraction, um, they said on-click is the worst thing ever. You never do that because it's, uh, you combine behavior and view, and it's not a good thing, and stop doing that. So everybody stopped doing that and started doing that via jQuery. And now we have Angular. And this is the only way to do that. So when it's on click, it's really bad. But when it's ng dash click, you're good. It's OK. Um, so this is the way to do this. Is there is actually no other way. So if you look at that and say, oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> You'll have to live with that. <laughs> um, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Because if you do think about that, um, and this is the template. In HTML, when you use jQuery and stuff, it's not a template. It's just it's really the, the, what's going to the UI. ng-click is not going to end up as something in the HTML page. right? It's something that tells Angular, this is what happens when you click the button. And behind the scenes, what's going on is that Angular is going to um, have an event handler for this click event. So you can say it's, it's better than on-click, but it looks the same. <laughs> anyway, so we have everything here now. Uh, what we did not do is um, we didn't say to Angular where, which controller to use and where to use it. So I'm going to find this container div. This actually contains everything in the page. And tell it ng-controller. This is your controller, and your controller name is main CTRL. Now what, what that means is that the main controller will be responsible for everything inside this div, right? So let's see if that works. Oh, I want to, I'll remove that so it will look nicer. OK, so what should happen now is when I add tasks, so you say that this actually works. Uh, nothing happens on the tasks there, but this is reset whenever I click add task. So it actually works. And just look at how awesome that is. This is my code. It has nothing to do with HTML. It has nothing to do with the UI. I just use something that's called scope. And I have my object model, I have the task, I have a method, I have um, an object, but I don't have anything to do with the UI. The UI knows what it needs to do, right? It has the task title, task description, it has everything there. But <coughs> that's it. And this is data binding, right? What's data, data binding is that task title, when the user changed the input, it actually changes task title here, and I can do something when this changes. Also this, also it goes vice versa. When I change it here in the code, it goes back to the view. So if we return to the data binding that we talked about, this is awesome. Now think about unit testing. How many of you do unit testing? Really, or just like, yeah, we're trying. <laughs> 
um, no, that's good for you, that's good for you. Uh, think about that code. This is uh, testable code because there is nothing uh, with the UI here. And if you keep doing that uh, throughout your application, you can actually do that because you don't need to interact with the UI uh, most of the time, then you have very, very testable code um, which make it much more easier uh, to maintain your code base and, and write big and complex applications. So this is the first uh, demo, the first, uh, the beginning of our uh, uh, application. And by the way, the scope, there is a name for it actually. It's a view model. If you uh, know uh, stuff that use view models, uh, other frameworks that use uh, view models, this is exactly that. A view model is just uh, an object that connects between the controller and the view. And this is the scope. So you can see this uh, MVC architecture being a bit more like MVC VM or something like that. Uh, it's a, just a combination. But this scope is really, really nice. And you could see that everything that you want on the UI goes to the scope. Everything that you don't need on the UI do doesn't go to the, on the scope. And it just it works very, very good on big and complex applications. And it just, just works. And it's amazing. It's fun. HTML. Um, HTML is nice. But HTML is broken. HTML was designed like 20 plus years ago. Um, and it was awesome back then. It was great to uh, show documents with it. Look how good that looked. <laughs> with the silver background and stuff. That, that looks good. But this was what, what HTML was supposed to do. It was supposed to show documents. And that's it. No one ever thought that HTML would be used for applications. And we're not just talking about this task management application. We're talking about Gmail. We're talking about uh, calendars. We're talking about big applications. So no one ever thought that that would be the case. And what we end up with is if we, for example, this is an application, right? This is, um, this is TweetDeck. It's an application. It's a web application, right? Um, you can go like this, and you can do like this, and it, it, you can click stuff, and it, it looks really nice, right? But then you figure out that you're still in this HTML world. How do you do that? Like, what? What? This this does shouldn't happen. I have to have the ability to actually stop that from happening. This doesn't make any sense. Now, if you want a really nice thing to do for your colleagues, uh, get some of your colleagues. Uh, if they don't, you know what? If they know, don't know HTML, doesn't matter. Give them an HTML page with just one div. And tell them, okay, take this div and uh, put it in the middle of the screen you have two weeks. Let's see what happens. They will come back to you and say, ah, what, what's going on? It's just, uh, what? What's going on? It's just, it's just broken. So this is why we love HTML, <laughs> right? Because we always do workarounds to make stuff work. Uh, HTML and CSS is just, um, a big pile of workarounds, right? And it's fun because this is this is the challenges that we have to put divs in the middle of the screen. This is this is something that is still um, how do you call it? MP complete, right? Uh, or these are the, the unsolvable problems. So this is one of them. MPR. What? This is the MPR. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so um, <laughs> what I like about Angular is that they say, well, 
We cannot fix HTML because this is what we have. Now, HTML5 and all this stuff is, is nice, but it still doesn't fix any of the big problems. Um, it does help, but I guess it will take about 10, 20 more years to just break even, let's say, like that, to get to a point that HTML actually is for applications and not for documents. But Angular says, well, HTML, this is, it's problematic, but this is what we have, and we have to live with it. And it's okay. And what I like about Angular is that you can take HTML and you can just make it the problem smaller because you take the HTML, you create your own elements, you create new elements um, that are not real elements. You know, there is HTML behind them, but you can create new elements, you can improve existing elements, and make them work as you expect them to work. And this is very, very helpful. And again, it just uh, makes your life so much easier once you solve a problem, like uh, centering a div in the middle of the screen. Uh, you solve it once and you can reuse it all the time. This is great, right? This is great. Um, so let's start and see the built-in stuff that Angular has, and then we'll move on and see how we can uh, do that ourselves. So the first thing I want to do is, let's see here, I want to show the tasks, right? I don't see the tasks at the moment. So um, the tasks are here. OK, these are the tasks. And they just go with the UL, LI. This is the uh, HTML elements they are in. Let's remove the second task. And what ng, uh, Angular has is something that's called ng-repeat, which is something that is missing from an, uh, HTML. Um, maybe it's uh, intended to do that. But this is, uh, uh, we don't have this in HTML. And this is just a repeater, right? We give it, for example, task in tasks. And um, what's going to do now, it will take all of this element and re-insert uh, re, re, uh, that. Like, it will duplicate each and every um, element for every item in the tasks array. And you will see all the tasks just by doing that. So what we don't have, we want to have the title, right? So we just do task.task.title. And here, task.description. And we're pretty much done. Let's see that. So now, when we start, we don't have tasks, right? And when I do that, it just add it, right? So look how cool that is. And if you're coming from jQuery background, something like that, this might take a while to do in jQuery. And here, you see how easy it is. And again, data binding. <laughs> the magic of data binding, because I didn't write any code. What happened is that tasks was changed here. When I did that, I actually added a new task. And when I added a new task, this UI element, because of this ng repeat thing, knew that I added a new task and added it to the list by itself, because this is what data binding is. And again, crazy. <laughs> so much fun. Um, small tip, in Angular 1.2, they added something called track by. And you can do this, tasks.id. And then uh, it actually helps in performance. So uh, if you have big lists, um, Angular just goes through the changed items and you, it knows what to change because it tracks it by the ID. So you need some kind of a unique ID or something like that. And then, then it just changes the rows that actually change. If you don't have that, it will just rewrite the entire HTML for this repeater. Okay, so just a new thing, a new thing in Angular 1.2. Um, okay, so. Uh, we have that. Let's see that everything's still working. Cool. 
So um, we have that. Now let's add something because something that is really missing in my uh, um, application here is a way to complete task. No task management system is done without a way to complete tasks. So the first thing I need to do is add a way to know if a task is completed. So I'm going to add to my uh, task object a completed property. And it will start with a false. Let's add another function, another function to the scope that can toggle this completed. So, scope dot uh, toggle completed equals function. Now we're going to get a task here, okay? And task dot completed equals uh, task dot not task dot completed. So this will toggle from true to false and from false to true. So this is all I need to do in the code. Now let's do what we need to do in the UI. So in order to complete a task, I need some kind of a button, right? So let's add a button. Um, button. Let's say it's a complete dash uncomplete. We can take care of that as well, but it doesn't matter at the moment. <coughs> complete uncomplete and uh, ng dash click equals uh, toggle completed task. Now, this is a really nice thing because uh, some frameworks do not allow you to uh, call a method, execute a method with parameters. And then it makes, uh, makes it hard to understand, especially in repeaters like that, uh, to know which task we are working on, right? So you need to have some kind of uh, an index on on the element or something like that, and you start investigating the HTML DOM in order to understand where the uh, user has, has clicked. This is very convenient because what's going to happen now, Angular, when someone clicks this button, it will call toggle completed with the actual task that we are working on, on the, the same row. So this is very, very, um, very handy. Now we want to see that the task was completed, right? Um, so let's do this via CSS, okay? So I want, when a task com is completed, I want to add uh, a CSS class. So let's remove this because I don't want it to be blue. And with ng repeat, I have also something that's called ng-class. <coughs> and it has this uh, kind of weird notation, weird syntax, but that, that's the way it is. Um, it says, okay, this is, let's not info success. Sorry, this, this is the name of the CSS class, which will be added when task is complete, task.completed is true. Okay, so this is the expression and this is what's gonna be added. When task.completed is false, this class will be removed, okay? So again, we have, if we did it with jQuery, it would take much more time, and this is just a very, very expressive way to do that. Um, so let's see how that looks like, if it actually works. So I add a new task, and I complete, boom, uncomplete, complete, uncomplete. And again, getting back to data binding. <laughs> You're like, stop with the data binding, we understand it's nice. <laughs> We don't have any behavior related thing here. Just, it says, okay, this is how it should look like when task is completed. We don't say how you complete it, don't say anything. We just say, okay, this is where you called it the com to complete it, do whatever you want to do with it. But this li here, when this task is completed, will add this thing. So this is what we have in the UI, everything that is UI related in the code, we just do tasks that completed. We just change that, that's it. Again, no UI at all in the code. Again, very, very convenient. Now think about that also, uh, if we think about data binding, because right now, this is uh, bound to the tasks 
uh, list, right? And if we have, I don't know, some big team, right, working on uh, um, this application, and they want, I don't know, to have uh, things that shows all the tasks here. I don't know. This this is what they want to do. They just work with this tasks object, right? So they what they put it here and present it to the user, and it doesn't matter where this tasks object is changed from a task from here complete uncomplete or wherever, it will affect this and that and everywhere else that is dependent on these tasks objects. So again, uh, w we've been doing a very, very complex uh, and big applications with Angular. And this data binding thing is a lifesaver. And it just, even in big, very big applications, it makes, m makes it very easy to, uh, to work with. Because again, you, ha you can have multiple teams just working on this um, objects on the code, and the UI will just change itself uh, accordingly. Um, so it's very, very powerful, all this uh, separation of concerns and data binding which happen here. And it happens here by, by default. You don't have to do anything. Um, OK. So. This, is, this was just a few things that Angular has built in. Now, the next thing is what's called directives. And directives is, for me, it's the killer feature in, in Angular. It's one of the uh, things that blew my mind when I started working with Angular. Um, directives is a, is a way to create your own HTML elements or enhance um, existing HTML elements. And the idea here is to create reusable components, which is very, very important in big applications. Because think about it, you always, we will always need the date picker, right? And how many of you have done date pickers? Yeah, almost all of you. And you just, you always need this. And, and it just, you always do the same code because you cannot create reusable components, at least on the client side. Um, and directives is exactly for that. You create a reusable component, and then we'll see how this can be a reusable component, a really reusable component, um, which has HTML, the template for the component, the JavaScript for the comp component, so we have the behavior, and the CSS. So it all comes as a package, and you can work with it um, and reuse it all over the application. And um, we'll talk later what we can do with that. But really, the uh, possibilities here are endless. And then we'll talk about it a bit later. So I uh, won't expand on it now. Um, what I want to do, uh, let's take this task here and create a, con a directive out of it. So we will create a reusable component so we can have tasks shown everywhere in our application. So um, in order to use the directive, I first need to, to change some stuff. Uh, first of all, I need to um, have, if I have more than just the controller, I need to have what's called a module. When I have a module, a module in, in, in Angular is just something that uh, contains other stuff. So you can have controllers, several different comp uh, controllers. You can have directives. You can have services that we will talk about later. You can have uh, like a package of a lot of stuff uh, that you can reuse um, in other applications or just use it as your uh, center uh, central module for your application, something like that. Uh, but again, if you have more than just a controller, you need this. You must have a module. So let's create a module, angular.module, um, demo app. And we give it this empty array because this is the dependencies that we have for the module. We can have other modules brought into the application. So a lot of uh, third-party components 
uh, that have wrappers for Angular will come as um, um, Angular modules. So you will add them here. It's just like add references in .NET or something like that. So uh, this is where you uh, put them. Right now we don't have dependencies, so we just put an empty array. Now in order to create the controller, we just do this main CRL and we give it the function right it's a, it's an anonymous function now so this is for the controller and um, now we can create a directive module dot directive now let's one more thing so I won't forget when you do that, you need to tell Angular which uh, module is the main module. So for each Angular application, you will have this ng-app um, statement, usually on the HTML element. So here, you tell it, OK, this is the main uh, module. That's it. That's all you need to do. So let's create a directive. So we are in a directive, we give it a name. So this is the name, task. And it gets a function. And this function is actually, uh, uh, it will return a configuration for this directive. So we do a return here, and it will return some configuration. So the first thing is what's called restrict. This tells Angular where to look for this directive. Because what Angular does, it gets an, the HTML, it goes and, look, and looks for task. right? So it can look for it in four different places. First thing is, this is how you do it, E, which is element. So you can have something like this in your code. OK, so you're actually creating a new element. Second one is A. What's A? Attribute. <laughs> so this is how it's going to look like. OK, just like that. So any element can have this attribute on it, and then Angular will pick it up. Next thing is C. What's C? Class, CSS class. Now, this is actually a bit weird. I saw this a few times, uh, actually, in, in production. But it's a, it's a bit weird, because then you don't know if it's a CSS class, a real CSS class, or something from Angular. So it's a possibility. And the last one is M. What is M? No one has ever known, uh, ever guessed that. No one. So. It's a comment. Now, what it's, why it's not C? Because C is taken. So, um, so it's another weird way to. Uh, this I, I've never seen in production, but it's a way to do this. So you have four different <coughs> things E, A, C, M. You can have all of them here. Uh, most of the time, you, you will have E or A or both. And uh, I saw code that had this, just saying. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, we're, we're, we'll need an element, so we'll use that. Now, the next thing I need is template. Now, I can have uh, just a template here. So I can write div, uh, whatever. Um, writing HTML inside a JavaScript string, not that big of a fun. So you have a better solution, uh, task URL, and you give it uh, a URL, a relative URL, and you will put the task um, template in this uh, HTML file. So we will create this HTML file in a second. Uh, and what Angular will do, it will actually go to the server, fetch this HTML, and use it. Uh, and it has this cache. Uh, thing so it will be cached. It will be done only once, not every time. Next thing is scope. Now, um, I told you that directives 
are actually reusable components. Now, if this directive was to be reusable and it wasn't inside, uh, it, it was put inside a controller and it used the scope, the entire scope of the application, if you had two of these, did this would mean trouble, right? Because two of these will just go over each other, and this is not good. So once you create this, you tell it you have a scope of your own. This is what's called an isolated scope. It's a scope just for that, and so it doesn't overlap anything. And the idea here is that you can say how we interact, what are my, my exit points to the external scope. So you have three different op options here. First one, uh, what we, uh, we are going to need, we're, we're going to need uh, some kind of a data source. This is going to be the task itself. And here it has this weird symbol syntax. I don't know why they chose it, maybe to make it uh, harder for people to understand, I don't know. Uh, first thing is this. This tells Angular that this um, variable is going to be two-way binding. So if this data source is changed inside the control, uh, inside the directive, it will affect the uh, variable outside in the uh, in the external scope, and vice versa. If the if it changes in the external scope, it will change inside um, the directive as well. Another way is. Uh, the at sign, have an idea what it is? One way binding, which means just from outside in. Okay, when you change it from outside, it will be changed inside. Um, but if you change it from inside, it doesn't affect the outside. Okay, so this is another way. And last but not least, and you probably think this is one way from inside to outside, but no. This is a callback. So you can have a method, a function from the outside, from the external scope going into uh, the uh, isolated scope, and then you can call it from the uh, code of the task, and it will be executed on the external scope. Anyway, what we need is the simplest, it's just two-way data binding to get the task from outside and uh, change it fr from inside, from outside, it doesn't matter. We just need it in our code. Last but not least here, uh, we need the behavior, right? So this is what's called the link function. And it gets a scope. This is the isolated scope of this task. It gets the element that this task directive is working on and all the attributes uh, that are given on the uh, element itself. So you can investigate that. Um, most of the time you will need the scope and the elements, but attributes is also very helpful. Um, we don't need anything here right now, so let's leave it like that. So what we need now is this task HTML, right? So let's create a new file, save it. Uh, task.html and yum, yum, yum. this is what I want. I want all the uh, tasks from inside. So I have the title, description, and the uh, button that completes and uncompletes um, a task. So I put it here. What's, what is different now is that it's not called task anymore, it's called data source. Okay, remember we changed the name. So now it's data source. So the task HTML is pretty much complete. And what we need now is add it here, right? So now we are going to add a new element. This doesn't exist in HTML, right? But we added that HTML right now, that the new HTML element. And we say data source is task. That's it. And we have one thing missing, which is this target completed 
thing because toggle completed is now called from inside the directive, right? And this doesn't exist in the internal scope here, okay? So let's say that our task directive works and knows how to toggle the completed flag. So um, that's it, right? So we have a directive. We created a new element um, that shows a task, uh, knows how to complete and uncomplete it. And um, we can reuse it all over the application. We currently don't need that, but we can reuse it just like so. Just a new element called task. Let's see that it actually works, and I didn't screw anything up. So you see this is actually happening. When I complete and uncomplete it, this is a cool idea because the toggle completed thing is <coughs> inside, right? And it changes the task. Now, the thing that changes the background from um, nothing to green is this ng class, which is outside, right? So this is the two-way data bind, right? I change the task inside. It changed the uh, completed flag on the task on the external scope as well. And then everything reacts accordingly. So um, this is very, very, very handy. Like um, you can do a lot of stuff, like directives. Uh, when I uh, do courses about, uh, training courses about NGRA, we have about half a day to a day about directives because there are so much more uh, possibilities and settings to this, uh, this thing here. Um, this is just a very, very small amount of that, and there's so much more. And in what we did in another, in one of my projects, we created an infrastructure that we created what's called a DSL, Domain Specific Language, with directives. So let me show you. This is a, I took a screenshot of the code. And I hope you can see that. So we have a view, section, row, lookup, number, string, list. You can see all of these um, elements. This is how they uh, write screens. They have the infrastructure, and they don't write HTML at all. They write this, they use this DSL, uh, the new elements that we created. And this creates HTML eventually, because um, we have, just like here, we have the template HTML, which is the real HTML that's going to be inside the uh, HTML DOM. Because if we create something that is called task, the browser doesn't know what task is, right? And it will never know what task is. So this is how we um, created a new HTML version of our own. And just like I said, that uh, when we had that HTML is broken, right? And HTML has a lot of problems. We created this uh, DSL. We created our own HTML. And what happens from there is that all of the bits and bytes of the HTML, they are taken care of inside these directives. And we take care of them just once. And we don't need to take care of them here and there and here and there, right? So it took time to get to this kind of infrastructure. But once you get there, it's amazing, really. The, uh, they create new screens uh, for the application uh, they have. And it's kind of a complex application. They create new screens in uh, about two days with all everything that you can think about in a, a line of business application. And it's something that we never thought we could, could achieve, but Angular just allowed us to do that. Um, so directives is really a killer feature. It's not an easy thing. Uh, you can see that. I'm sure you're looking at that and like, Ugh. but um, when you get that and you use it and you create an infrastructure, it just, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Um, okay. How are we on time? Cool. Okay. 
next thing I want to talk about is services. Services is uh, another part of Angular. And this comes to show you that Angular has this idea of architecture. Um, and it's kind of hard to break it. Now, just like any other framework, you can break it. And a lot of people do break it. But um, you need to, uh, most of the time, you can go uh, and you can, you can kind of work with an architecture and it works great, even in big applications. Um, and one of the main things in, in the architecture, and we saw the MVC thing and the directive things, and services is another thing. And the idea here is that services will give you all the things that do not relate to the UI. So you have requests coming in to the controller, right? And the controller does whatever it needs to do, but when it has logics, or it needs to go to the server, or it needs to go to some other resource, it will ask a service to do that for it. So you have services that go to the server, go to resources, do logics, run web workers, if, if uh, uh, you're familiar with that. Um, and so it gives you another layer of services uh, for the applications. For the application, and what's nice about that, that you can create a module just with services. And most of the time, services are kind of repeating themselves, especially in, in the same company. So you just create a module with the services and reuse it in all of your projects. And that's very, very nice. So let's create a service for our application. And the service will just save and load uh, our tasks. Um, and we'll use the local storage just so we don't need the server side. So we have the module dot service. Um, let's call it task saver. And again, this returns the um, actual instance, right, of the, serv of the service. Now, I don't need uh, anything fancy, so I'm just going to return an object with functions. So the first function is going to be uh, load. Uh, no, first one is going to be save. And it's going to be function, uh, which gets tasks. And um, local storage dot tasks equals um, JSON dot stringify. This is probably one of the coolest names for methods ever. Uh, stringify. Uh, this is just because local storage all only saves stuff as strings. So we need to serialize that to JSON. And then do load return JSON dot. You would think that if we had, they had stringify, so cool. So now you have parsify or something. But no, just parse. Local storage dot tasks. Um, and that's it, right? This is our um, service. That, that's all we needed. Now we need to use it. Now, how are you going to use it? Something that you didn't notice, or uh, you were uh, too uh, uh, tired or something, is that scope there, right? Um, where is it coming from? We're just using it here, right? This, we're using it just like someone initiated it for us, right? And this is exactly what's happening. What I all, only what I need to do in order to use this task saver is add task saver here. Now, what's going on here? This is what's called dependency injection. It's something that is coming with uh, AngularJS built in. And the idea here is that you never knew a new uh, a, a service or um, something, something else, I don't know, like scope or other uh, built-in stuff. You just get that from the framework. And why do you need that? Because it makes your software much more testable. They thought about testability from the beginning. And this is one of the um, options. This is, uh, this is what came out of it, uh, this dependency injection idea. 
Um, so right now, it looks what it does. It looks for the parameters here, and it says scope, dollar scope, and task saver, and it goes to the uh, where it holds all the names of all the um, functions and all the objects that relate to Angular. Um, and then it says, OK, dollar scope is something built in. So I'm going to get that and initiate that and do and return and put the instance inside dollar scope. And task saver, I'm going to look for that. And where is it? This is exactly what we put here, OK, because it's the same name. So it, it works by the name uh, at the moment. You can make it a bit better. Uh, I'm go not going to uh, go over it, but that's the idea, right? Um, so it's really uh, a nice idea. And now what we need to do, we need to add two methods, one to load the task and one to save the task. So let's do scope.load tasks equal function. Um, so, I want to do scope.tasks. This is my object model. Uh, task saver.load. And same thing with scope.save task. Uh, function. Yeah, forgot that. Um, task saver.save. No. Dot save. Uh, scope dot task. What am I missing? The UI. There is no way to call this now, right? So let's add at the beginning two buttons. Uh, first one is going to be load, and the second one. Uh, it's going to be save. Uh, ng dot dash click load tasks. Ng dash click save tasks. So now we had the service. What's calling the service from the controller, and what's calling the controller from the view. So we had all the layers, and if I wrote everything correctly. It should work. So let's create first task one, uh, do something. Uh, task two, uh, sleep. I don't know. It's a very important one. Uh, let's complete this and let's do save. Uh, OK. And reload and push load. And it works. Now, again, data binding, we save the tasks. We loaded that, just put it inside scope.tasks, right? And the UI, it knows um, the, the class to put it in, uh, wherever to put it, the same um, amount of uh, items are shown, the, the correct page. Everything that you saved is now loaded and bound to the UI. Um, and you see how, how effective and how powerful that is. Um, in terms of an application. And look what we made in li like an hour. Um, an entire application, you can complete, uncompleted, um, load, save, add tasks. And of course, you can do much more. But in an hour, I think it's a very nice thing. And we, we also have a reusable task component that we can use somewhere. So really, there is a lot of things that we've done here. and. It's not that uh, hard to accomplish. And it doesn't get much more complex than that in other, in, in, in like bigger applications or other applications. It just, this is how it looks like. Just much more code because it's bigger applications. A few more things that I want to talk about about Angular. First is the learning curve. Um, the learning curve. I don't know how you feel right now, but the learning curve is not that easy, right? It's, uh, it's not that easy to learn Angular. It's something that you need to go through. You need to understand the way Angular does stuff. Um, when I started with Angular, and I started with jQuery before that, 
And jQuery, the way you do stuff with jQuery and the way you do stuff with Angular is different, uh, totally different. And I had, like, really, I did stuff, um, God forbid. Um, it's, um, for example, I had this, there is a, this method that you need to call in Angular for uh, when you use uh, third party components. And I didn't really know how to use it back then, like <coughs> three years ago. And I called it once and didn't help. So I, I don't know what I thought, but I said, well, let's call it twice. So it was one call and then another call and it didn't work. So I said, well, let's call it three times. Third time, it worked. <laughs> so I had three lines of code, same lines, and, and after three lines, it worked. Um, I still, until today, don't know why it worked. I guess it was before Angular was uh, 1.0, so it probably was a bug in Angular and my bad coding because I just didn't know how to work with Angular. Um, I don't do this anymore, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I learned, but it was really hard. And if you go and look for, um, in the web, there are tons of articles and blog posts about, uh, I'm a jQuery, um, Developer, I want to move to Angular. How do I do that? So there are a lot of posts about that because there is this thing called Ang the Angular way because Angular has this idea of how you do stuff and you probably want to go with Angular and not do stuff like this. And you can do stuff like this, but after that, you down the road, you will regret that. So you probably want to uh, learn this um, as good as you can. Like you can uh, go to a training course, you can read books, you can uh, um, watch uh, courses online. Try it yourself uh, before you jump and start working on something in your workplace. Uh, try it yourself, try creating your own thing because um, you must know Angular before you uh, start doing stuff. Uh, just so after that, um, you won't need to rewrite everything. Um, you can also hire uh, consultants that, uh, that know what they do. Um, I don't know who, but uh, you, can, you can do that. Uh, but really, just, just learn before you uh, uh, <coughs> jump into that. Third-party third components, they usually are written with uh, jQuery. So uh, they, you need to write a wrapper around them for Angular. So, uh, this, this is just something that you need to know. Um, most of them, if not all of them, already have by now um, wrappers for Angular, but if they don't, you need to write them. You need to take, care, to, to take this into consideration. Um, one thing we did in one of my projects is that we took a grid. Now think about a grid. We all do grids, right? all the time. Grids is something that shows data and we all work with data and we all need grids. And what don't we have in HTML? Grids, right? So you have a lot of uh, third party components for grids. And what we did, we created the directives that, the directive that drops um, a third party component, a third party grid. And this project, they took grid grids to another level, let's call it like that. They, everything was a grid. Now, they, th they said, well, this is a list, but well, we would need the, everything that there is in the grid, so let's do it the grid. So everything is a grid. And in some point of the application, we uh, figured out that the grid component wasn't right for us. Uh, it just didn't have everything that we needed. So we took um, a decision and just uh, change the third party component in the directive. In the directive. Yeah. yeah, so this was uh, actually a very nice experience because the grid was everywhere. So uh, we changed the implementation of the directive and it just worked. Of course, the CSS was a mess <laughs> and it took a bit of a while to fix that. But in terms of JavaScript and the code, it was amazing. Um, so this is something that, again, going back to the infrastructure, just something that uh, really proves itself uh, in production and 
just something that you need to take into consideration when you're creating third-party components, when you're using third-party components, uh, just know that you need to wrap them with your own code. Now, most of the things that I do now is migrating existing applications. Um, I have a few projects. One is uh, moving from Silverlight to uh, Angular. One is moving from WinForms to Angular. And one, one is moving from, God forbid, VB6 uh, <laughs> to Angular. Not kidding, VB6. Um, so um, what we figured out the way to do this because we see a lot of demand for that. A lot of people uh, want to be on the web, maybe because it's a buzzword, maybe because it's great. I don't know. We will talk in a few years and we'll see if it was that great. But at the moment, it's a big hype and everybody is moving to the web. And when they move into the web, they're using Angular for that. Um, so what I recommend you, again, first of all, learn all the team uh, everybody on the team needs to know Angular before you start doing that. Otherwise, you will have problems. Um, after you learn, uh, create an infrastructure. I showed you the um, infrastructure we use uh, that we created in uh, one of my projects. This is something that we did there. In another project, we didn't take this... Uh, entire approach to create everything and not need the HTML at all. We just created components. Uh, the, uh, the guys who implement the views, they can use the components, uh, but they still write divs and all this stuff. Uh, but you do need an infrastructure. You want this. It makes sense. So you create uh, all the components that you want, which is, I don't know, a text box, and a number box, a date picker, a grid, or whatever that you need. And then you reuse it all over your views. So create an infrastructure, have a team just for the infrastructure. And then start implementing the views. And you can just create a basic infrastructure and then uh, implement the views and enhance the infrastructure while you continue implementing the views and continue like that. So this is my uh, suggestion if you're thinking about that take this path because uh, down the road it just it proved itself and it just it's amazing to see I really didn't think it would work of course there are problems like any other thing uh, most of the time when you almost hit production you get to a point where you have performance problems and every I gotta say that they uh, have a new version almost every uh, every other week and every version improves the, um, the performance. And of course, there are a lot of uh, things that you can do in order to make your application run faster. And um, so, of course, there are problems. Uh, Angular is awesome, but there are things that you need to know. And um, again, it's very easy to fix them when you have an infrastructure uh, other than just going through all the views in all the pages and fix stuff. So just my uh, recommendation to you. Now, last thing that might be uh, a problem. Angular, until version 1.2, supported uh, IE 6 and 7, and of course, all the other um, browsers. From 1.2, they do not support i6 and i7. <coughs> From 1.3, which was released a few days ago, they do not support IE8. Okay, so this is something you need to take into consideration because if it doesn't work, um, if, if it doesn't support what you uh, need, then you might have a problem. So you might want to stick with an older version of Angular or just not use Angular. This is just something that you need to think about. Um, why are they doing that? They are um, a part of Google. And Google, by the way, in Gmail, they don't support IE8 anymore. Okay, So they just uh, get in line with other Google products and drop support for IE8. Um, I do hope it works. 
So there is no IE6, 7, or 8 anywhere in the world, or 9, or 10, or <laughs> just, just stop using IE. <laughs> but uh, if we can get rid of IE6, 7, and 8, that would be great. But I know it's not always the case. So just know that you might, th this, is the, this is how it works. Um, so just need to know about that. Um, OK, so uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So let's do that. Do you have any questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so uh, the question was, why do I handle directives and services differently? Uh, because directives, I just created it here, and then I used it on the UI. And service, I created it here, but I needed to say to the class, to the um, to the controller function, that here I want to use task saver. So, services and directives serve a different purpose. Uh, directives, they go from Angular to the code. Services go from the code to the other code, and it doesn't go from the, through the UI. So what happens here in the directive, you say to Angular, go look for an element named task. Once you find it, uh, put, replace it with this template, and this is the behavior it has. So what's going to happen is that Angular will start, will fire up this task directive. Uh, the service, on the other hand, it doesn't have a UI. So Angular doesn't know that it needs it or doesn't need it. So it's just there. It will not be initiated until someone requests it. And once it, you request it from here, you can use it inside the code. But this is the difference. The directive is handled by Angular when it goes through the HTML code. The service is just code that you need to call from other code in your application. So this is. Yes, everything that I put here can be uh, set in another file. The module.controller can be in one file, the rest on another file. It's, um, and it's, it's a best practice to do that. This, this is not the best practice. Just a demo. Yes. Um, in your directive, when you've got your um, completed top, you've got it in within a link function, um, as opposed to just declaring it on the isolated scope. What's the reason for putting it in that um, link function in your directive? Okay. Uh, you ask why do I need that, uh, or? Yes, OK. Oh, OK, OK. So the question is, what's basically, what's the difference between this and that? So scope is just a, a definition of what, uh, how you interact with the outer scope. So you, don't put, you cannot put code inside here. You just say, you are going to get a data source from outside. It's going to be two-way binding. And this is actually the name of the attribute. But you cannot put a uh, code inside here. Okay. Uh, the actual behavior is going to be in the link function. So this is this is the interaction. Yes. Yes. Hey, does the service resolve Google storage? So when you have a service, does it resolve Google storage? Google storage? Local, local storage. storage. Okay. How does it resolve local storage? Yeah, oh, okay. Local storage is just uh, something in the global element of JavaScript. It's a, so it doesn't need to look for that. Um, by the way, this is not a, like it's it's okay, but you might want to um, use it from uh, another service for testability reasons or some something like that. But yes, this is calling the global element. By the way, um, Angular has wrappers for almost all the um, global elements, so. Uh, if you have like something like window dot, uh, I'll just put it here. Uh, window dot something set timeout, for example, which is uh, something that you use pretty much uh, uh, a lot in applications. Um, so instead of doing that, because this is not testable whatsoever, 
Um, so you can have something that's called dollar timeout, which is exactly the same, um, but you can, you can get it through, just like we saw before, just put it there. This is something that comes with Angular. And actually, Angular has uh, like 10, 20, 30 uh, built-in services that you can use, like uh, timeout, like uh, um, HTTP to call to the server. You can use that. Um, there is a list of that, and you can uh, just uh, um, just use it. Just go through the documentation. Documentation is really good. Um, it was very very bad, uh, but about a year ago or something like that, they just rewrote everything, and it's just a really good uh, documentation. So. Um, just go to the website. It's angrojs.org, and um, uh, everything is just there. Yes? Uh, how do you run the connection to data basics and retrieving data from the database? So this is done f via a service. Um, you, you, uh, in order to connect to a database, you will have an API on the server that connects to a database. And then you will uh, connect to this API via the service that you have on the client. So you, you probably would go uh, with the REST service, which is another hype. Like if you go and read the specification for REST, um, it's this big. I still don't understand why they didn't need just one page, <laughs> because this is what I think they needed. <laughs> But it's something like that, like a thousand pages about REST and all the things that about REST. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a hype around that as well, because REST services are for the server. And this is how you connect to them from the client. And um, it's very, very easy. It's very nice. But you don't want to connect to the database from the client, because this is a huge security risk. So you probably want to do this on the server and just connect to your API. There is no uh, built-in SOAP uh, support. Um, I do recommend to not use SOAP because it just uh, sends tons of not unneeded data on the wire, and you don't need that. Uh, but you do have other uh, frameworks, uh, not frameworks, libraries that you can use in order to call SOAP services. So if you have them, you can, you can actually do that. Yes. Yeah, so the publish subscribe, there is, is a <coughs> notation of publish subscribe in Angular. Not the best. It works for a specific thing. If you really want publish subscribe, you would probably go with a, and there is a library for that, an external library, not for, uh, from Angular, but you can use it because it's just JavaScript. Um, but you can call uh, different services from, like, service to service. You can definitely do that. You just, just like we did in a controller, if you had another service, like, I don't know, other service, you can just uh, put it here and then call it from here. So you can, you can do that. Uh, but publish subscribe, the, the, it's not implemented the right way in, in Angular. And at least it's not for that. It's more for UI components to interact between them. Yes? How would you do animation? Uh, it depends what you need. Uh, Angular comes with something called ng-animate, which allows you to animate when you are moving between states. For example, when you add, you're using ng-class, like we saw, you can actually add more uh, classes that, ha that uh, Angular will use and put that before it moves to the new class and then moves to the new class. And when it leaves that, it will, you can actually animate that. Um, but most of the time, you will probably want to use jQuery UI or something because they, then you can have full control over what you want and what you need. Yeah, one more question, and we'll be done. Yes. Um, Angular operates uh, occupies the same space as the Randall. Um, the Randall is supposedly merging to form Angular two. Mm -hmm. 
This is the well. Uh, this is the best question I could ever have to end this this uh, session. So thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so the question was: uh, There is another framework called the Randall, uh, which uh, they said uh, that it's merging with Angular, and what it's going to be? It's actually going to be a plugin for Angular and going to work above Angular. So what they're going to do? You're going to keep the API of the Rundle, uh the same, and everything underneath it is going to be Angular. So you don't even know that Angular is there. So it's it's work that you're doing, but it's uh, this is actually it's a very good question because this is what I mean when Angular is the one framework to rule them all, because what you see now in the Rundle, I think it's just the first one, is that Angular is becoming um, the de facto. Um, infrastructure and you will see frameworks built on top of Angular uh, like Durandal and other stuff uh, along the way uh, down the road uh, that just use Angular underneath and you will never know that you're actually using Angular. So thank you for your question because it's just, uh, just great to end with th that question. It's just really the one framework to rule them all. It's, if, it's not going, if you're not going to use Angular by using Angular, you will use Angular by using a framework that is written on top of Angular. And I'm sure this is going to happen. It just it will take a few years or something like that. So um, if you have any more questions, just come to me or uh, find me or send me an email. These are my details. Um, thank you very much and have a good day. <laughs>